Welcome, I'm Ian Stimson from Geology at Keel, and in this short video we'll look at the mantle, mantle convection and plate tectonics. This is our conventional view of mantle convection. The mantle is heated from below, becomes less dense, rises, spreads out across the surface, dragging the oceanic plates with it, cools and descends back into the mantle, creating the convection cell. And so we've got this view that plate tectonics is driven by circulating convection cells within the mantle. But just how much of this is actually true? Let's start with what evidence we do have. This is the reference Earth model compiled from a series of earthquake travel times. In fact, tens of thousands of earthquake travel times. We can see that the mantle can be broadly divided into two parts, the upper mantle going down to 660 kilometres and the lower mantle down to the core mantle boundary at around about 2,900 kilometres. The structure of the upper mantle is largely heterogeneous. We can see major jumps in velocities. We've got a low velocity zone around 1 to 200 kilometres and we've got jumps in velocity at 410 kilometres and 660 kilometres. The lower mantle is far more homogeneous except for the bottom couple of hundred kilometres where we start to see some strange effects near the core mantle boundary in a layer known as D double prime. But that's probably the topic of another video. The outer layers of our Earth can be subdivided under two main headings, compositional boundaries and rheological or mechanical boundaries occur actually at different depths and this can lead to some quite confusing uh, nomenclature. On the compositional side we have the Earth's crust which is either oceanic which is a mafic composition or continental which will be felsic to intermediate. Below this Morovisic boundary at about 10 kilometers underneath the oceans and 40 kilometers underneath the continents, we go to a completely different composition, the mantle. Mantle is ultramafic in composition and principally formed of peridotite, which is a combination of olivine and pyroxene. As we go down within the earth, the increase in pressure can cause a transformation of uh, firstly orthopyroxene to garnet at 220 kilometers, uh, olivine transforms to a beta spinel, wadsleyite at around 410 kilometers, then to ringwoodite, a gamma spinel at 520 kilometers, and then finally there's a major change at 660 kilometers where we go to uh, minerals with a very dense uh, structure, so-called uh, silicate perovskite and magnesia wustite. On the rheological side, we have a threefold division. The upper mechanically strong outer layer is referred to as the lithosphere. And this is essentially what our tectonic plate is. This is highly variable in depth from about 100 kilometers below the oceans to 200 kilometers below continents. And this transition from the mechanically strong lithosphere to the mechanically weak uh, asthenosphere is probably temperature controlled somewhere around about 1,300 degrees centigrade. The asthenosphere lower boundary is also variable in depth, again varying from about 180 kilometers uh, below uh, oceans to 220 kilometers uh, below continents. Again, probably temperature controlled around about 1,400 
400 degrees centigrade. Below this we go into another layer which is sometimes referred to as the mesosphere which is a mechanically uh, intermediate uh, plastic uh, mantle and it's this main part of the mantle which is convecting. Note that the textbook definition for the base of the asphenosphere is really very poorly defined and I've seen depths of 180, 220, 350, 400, 660 and 700 kilometres all given. I've taken here uh, the transition between what we suspect is a very mechanically weak low viscosity layer which we can define using the low velocity zone within the Earth's mantle. There are other big questions relating to the scale of convection within the Earth's mantle. We've seen that the 660 kilometre boundary is a major compositional boundary with a large jump in seismic velocity and density. Consequently we have to ask the question is can convection cells actually cross this boundary? It requires extra energy to do so, to transform from uh, spinels to uh, perovskite type structures and vice versa. And whilst we can probably say that subduction slabs and mantle plumes do cross this boundary because there is seismic evidence for them doing so, we're not that convinced that uh, convection cells can do the same. So a big question is, do we have thin layered convection within upper and lower mantles, or do we have whole mantle convection? And the jury is still out on this one. The asthenosphere is highly variable. The depth of the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary uh, we've seen can vary both on a global scale and on a local scale. Here, looking at the LAB boundary between southern uh, Spain and northern Africa. We can't think of it as a simple onion layer within our Earth structure. The top of the asthenosphere seems to be temperature controlled, somewhere around about 1300 degrees centigrade, where we're going from mechanically strong to mechanically weak material. And the bottom is even more poorly constrained possibly temperature controlled around about 1,400 degrees centigrade. Uh, it's much better developed below oceans and actually quite poorly developed beneath continents, leading us to think that there may be some kind of continental keel sitting beneath our continents. The asthenosphere is marked by a sharp drop in seismic velocity, particularly for that of S weights a strong attenuation of earthquake weights and a strong increase in electrical conductivity. All of these factors would imply that we've got at least some liquid at that depth, but is melting possible at these sorts of mantle temperatures and pressures? In fact, the Earth's geotherm, the temperature profile with depth, doesn't intersect with the solidus line the melting point of peridotite under normal situations within the mantle. We can get partial melting at the mid-ocean ridge and at hot spots where we add heat into the system and therefore increase the temperature profile or at subduction zones where the water trapped within the sediments actually decreases the melting point of peridotite but there is some people who would suggest that under normal circumstances we simply can't melt peridotite. Consequently we have some people who argue that by adding just small amounts of water or carbon dioxide uh, within the mantle will reduce the melting point and we can have about 1% partial melt which decreases the viscosity and forms our asthenosphere. But others would argue that there's no partial melt here, but a thin film of water between the grains of olivine within the peridotite actually has a similar effect of decreasing the velocity and decreasing the viscosity at these sorts of depth ranges. 
However, both employ a wet mantle of sorts, and the question has to be, can we only have plate tectonics on a planet with a wet mantle? Also, the lower viscosity layer essentially defines our plate boundary. Without a detachment at the base of the lithosphere, we don't have a plate. But if we've got a detached lithosphere, how does convection within the mesosphere couple to our lithosphere driving plate motion? Olivine within the mantle has an interesting seismic property. It's anisotropic. Seismic waves travel faster through olivine crystals in one direction than they do in others. And if convection aligns these olivine crystals, then we find that we have fast directions of seismic waves and slow directions, and these directions can be mapped. In general, the fast direction of our olivine crystals, the pale blue lines in this diagram, match the flow directions, the movement of the plates, the orange arrows. But you can see in some places, and particularly around trenches, this is not always the case. So is the mantle flow a cause of plate tectonics, or is it actually a consequence of it? So most people would probably agree that plate motion is intimately linked to mantle convection. The big question is, how? So this is a schematic of the possible forces that can act uh, on our tectonic plates. The conventional mantle drag force, FDF. We've also got other potential extra mantle drag underneath continents, if we've got a continental keel. We've got ridge push forces associated with both the injection of lava at the ridge and also the gravity uh, forces produced by the topographical expression of the ridge itself. We've got resistance along transform faults. We've got slab pull, a density contrast pulling our slab downwards, and slab resistance uh, between the uh, denser lower mantle and the slab itself. We've also got colliding resistance between uh, the overriding plate and the slab and a so-called uh, suctional force which may occur if the trench rolls back and pulls the overriding uh, plate sideways. If mantle drag was the main driving force of plate tectonics, then we would expect the larger the surface area of the plate, the more coupling there would be with the convection cells below, and therefore the faster the plates would move. But when we actually look at this, we can see that this is not the case. We have some big plates, like the Pacific, moving very quickly, and we've got some big plates like Europe and Antarctica and Africa, which are hardly moving at all. In fact, when we look at the relationship between continental area of a plate and its velocity, we actually see something of a negative correlation. We can see that plates with large continental areas like Europe and Africa and North America travel more slowly than the plates with small continental areas uh, such as the Pacific. So it would actually appear that having a continent provides a break on plate motion and this is probably associated with the more poorly developed uh, low viscosity detachment beneath continental areas. Similarly, if we look at the ridge push forces and transform resistance by comparing the proportion of spreading boundary of a plate margin or the transform boundary proportion of a plate margin we can see no correlation between the percentage of this boundary type and the velocity of the plate. Where we do appear to have a correlation, however, is with the percentage of subducting boundary and plate velocities, with a high proportion of subduction boundary broadly correlating with a higher plate velocity. We've got two possible forces at work here. 
The first is a suctional force caused by trench rollback. If we have an old oceanic lithosphere which is dense, it wants to subduct and the position, the hinge of uh, where subduction actually occurs can roll back towards the ridge. In doing so, it will pull the overriding plate towards it, the so-called subduction suction force. However, not all trenches show rollback. However, a much more general candidate for a driving force of plate tectonics is that of slab pull. Essentially, the denser subducting slab, more dense than the mantle that's surrounding it, provides a gravitational driving force for plate motion. So the key driver to plate tectonics appears to be this stuff, eclogite, which is comprised of garnet and clinoperoxy. It's generated by the high pressure metamorphism of gabbro and basalt within the crust at a depth around about 45 kilometers. The density of eclogite is around 3,460 kilograms per cubic meter. Compare this with the normal mantle material, peridotite, here containing olivine and orthoperoxine. This has a density of 3,420 kilograms per cubic meter. So if we've got eclogite within our subducting slab, it's more dense than the surrounding mantle. And so will generate slab pull. As the slab descends into the mantle because of uh, phase changes to more high density phases, the density contrast between the eclogite and the surrounding uh, mantle material will decrease. So the plate slows down and this is manifest in the different types of earthquakes that we see within the slab. In the upper part, we see tensile earthquakes because the slab is being pulled down. In the middle zone, we see very few earthquakes. And as we approach the 660 kilometer boundary between the upper and lower mantle, we get compressional earthquakes as the slab has trouble penetrating this density boundary. Below 660 kilometers, we see no earthquakes at all. So as a consequence, we can surmise that the largest effect on plate velocity is slab pull. But other forces such as ridge push and subduction suction probably contribute because plates like North America, which have no subduction margins, are still moving. So we're left with a few more questions than answers. Is convection within the mantle whole mantle or layered within upper and lower mantle? Just where is the base of the asthenosphere? Is there partial melt in the asthenosphere? Can you have plate tectonics without a wet mantle? Is mantle flow a cause or a consequence of plate motion? Is mantle drag a positive or negative force? Is slab pull really the driving force of plate tectonics? And can you have plate tectonics without eclogite, which has implications for the early earth, where temperature was higher and we may not have had eclogite, and implication for other planets with different temperature profiles? So on that note, I'll leave it there. I'm Ian Stimson at Keele University and thank you for watching.